Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Couple of things you should know. One is Aspa has just done a very long session with my wife where she's got all the interesting bits out of her that we we'll still try and make this work. Secondly, Aspa and I have known each other for a long time. Though oddly enough, in a world where I didn't write about food and she wasn't cooking food, we both knew each other as journalists. So it's been a joy for me to rediscover Aspa Khan not only as a great chef, but as a person who speaks out for things she believes in, a person who has a very, very definite point of view, and who's told British Indians and Brits generally that Indian food isn't curry house food, nor is it this Frenchified presentation food that you may eat at so-called Michelin star restaurants. This is what real Indian food is like. And she succeeded, I think, beyond anyone's wildest dreams. She is the only Indian chef I know who's not played by the rules, gone on to have huge success anyhow. To date, she's, forget about Indian, you're the only Brit to be featured on Netflix chef's table. And she is the only chef of any consequence, I think, who is taken seriously when she talks about courses, when she talks about kitchens in frontier zones, when she talks about the state of the world. It's a very, very huge responsibility. And do you wear it lightly or are you conscious of it? I am conscious of it because you can't wear it lightly because you do know that like this moment where I'm on stage with you. Yeah. I feel very humbled to be speaking to you here because you are the one who gave me a job when I looked nervous and uh, I was completely incompetent. <laughs> but you took a chance on me and gave me a job and I was very overwhelmed. And so for that, I'm very grateful to you. But I okay. understand one thing. You don't get moments again. No one is being guaranteed the next door. So every moment when I have an opportunity to speak to people here, also those who are watching it online. I want to reach out because I know that I need to shake the world gently. I need to talk about things that are important. And at the end of the day, all I need to afford is my kafan. I do not need to amass wealth. I do not need to be rich. But I need to know that I did the right thing, that I was on the right side of history. Which is my big question. Many people who've had the kind of fame you've had, and Asma is probably one of the most famous chefs in the UK, not just famous woman chef or famous Indian chef or whatever, is a famous chef. She's known by people who are not even interested in food because she's become a personality in her own right. Yet what's interesting is that she's never exploited it to make more money for herself. Why? Because I, I think that there are far more important things in life than money. I'm not dismissing money. You do need money sure. to do things in your life. But if I have a roof over my head and my children are taken care of and everything is okay, I think it's very important that I focus on raising important issues in public but also amplifying the voices of those who are unable to get on stage. Because every time I'm on stage, I look down. And for me, I do see, apart from the audience, I see rows of women in the darkness, who will never get the opportunity to come on stage, be under the spotlight, be interviewed by someone very important, and get to talk about them. So I see it as my moral duty that I spend as much of my time as I can to raise their voices, to raise issues, not just of women, but men and women. Really, it is about justice. It's about food justice, about equality. It's also about respect. And in England, I I talk about colonialism, I talk about racism, which nobody talks about because they feel, oh, let's not rattle the Gora. Let's rattle the Gora. Let's ask them because when they are hassling people, and forget about the fact that who is the Prime Minister right now, okay? He doesn't count. I'm talking about the Indian on the street. When someone picks on them and says, go back home, you want to ask them, you were in my country. You stripped us of everything that you had to actually impeach, you know, the governor of Bengal because he had stolen unacceptable amounts of money. We were left in the darkness when you left. The fact that people don't teach, they don't talk about colonialism in schools. The people do not understand. Why is this Bangladeshi shop here selling me curry? 
they will pick on this whole thing that this you know this is a curry house the dismissing of people who came to build our country broken after the second world war history is not taught and the problem is that then food gets implicated in this we need to talk about history and the food okay what's interesting about this is there are many people who've come from huge disadvantages have suffered a great deal and therefore naturally tell their stories now the thing that impresses me about asma is that she comes from a degree of privilege a mother who's here the one of the best known and most respected caterers in calcutta she had a very good job as a journalist she made a very successful marriage to a successful and respected academic she went to cambridge she studied law she had all of this going for her but something about her decided that that wasn't enough she met women who were coming to the park ayas nannies she saw what was happening and decided it was time to speak out so it didn't come because of your own disadvantages it came from a place of looking for justice so tell me about that it, because i think that i cannot breathe i cannot live this privileged existence if i know other people are in chains i could not enjoy all the beautiful things that were around me because i was aware that this was not a choice so even giving a small example that you know a lot of people in my family extended family and friends during ramzan you know i am fasting from dawn to dusk and there is a sense of you know great achievement that many of us are rakha hai but what about those their their azan means nothing their hunger is relentless their thirst is relentless dawn and dusk has no meaning i cannot enjoy the food i cannot enjoy my life if i don't feel i did something i am not driven that you know oh I, this is a good look or this is something that's trendy i must show some compassion and you know i am not that great savior that going going around the world trying to this is not a media opportunity yeah this is really driven by my feeling that i am so grateful that i have so much that i've met some interesting people i got great opportunities and i also want to talk about things that people don't speak about like everybody in england really thinks indian food is one thing it is absolutely swimming in ghee and cream and tomato this is indian food and anything else is gone along as what so there's a lot of things that bother me a lot and i spend a lot of my time trying to talk to people not being aggressive and i hope not coming across as you know someone pushy but i really want to have this conversation because i'm fed up of the bias yeah when i spoke about the fact that she came from privilege the one area where there was no privilege at all was food she taught herself how to cook using her mother's recipes when she was living in cambridge she started out using that employing women who would otherwise not have been empowered to help her cook and she started out doing dinner parties in her own house they moved to london they lived in a very nice house in a very nice area and she sort of sold tickets and did these dinner parties and she did all this as far as i can tell behind the back of your long suffering husband yeah, yeah behind tell us that's right <laughs> my husband is an academic he's a professor in economics he likes students but doesn't like people and definitely doesn't like relatives his own and mine so he's one of these people who stays away from everyone so if i told him i'm going to call 20 strangers and make them sit in your dining table they can see your precious study and feed them he would have absolutely flipped so i thought what so go harm him doesn't need doesn't need to know so every time he traveled i did it as a bag he came down and found the house very clean he didn't know what i was doing and also good thing is he is absolutely not in social media he would never in his life have met any of these people who came to his supper clubs so i knew there was no risk he doesn't have he still doesn't have any social media i think now he might but now i don't mind because i'm not doing anything behind his back but at that time i was and he was not into social media so that's how i did it so she started with that and then her first from what i remember her first venture into sort of a restaurant type space was when she started doing pop ups in a pub yeah and that would have gone unnoticed but at the time britain's most famous and respected food critic came in to eat there and said hey this is amazing food and wrote about it is that yeah. correct right? and this is where you know the role of the food writers the view sanghis of the world make a big difference 
Because when you are nobody and you are nothing, how do you get people to know where you are? Even where you are located, how will they know what your name is so that they can Google where you are? And this is what Faye Master did. She came uh, and she ate the food. And I know Veer, you've taken her down India. She mentioned that as well in the article. Uh, so she had a good understanding. She was also born in India. Yeah. So picked up the flavors, understood. What is she's looking for is the regionality of Indian food. Because she had got someone like Veer to show her what Indian food is. So that, that she actually described the food as it was as if she had gone back to India. That was a game changer. If you just said, oh, the butter chicken and all, oh my God, I don't know how to make butter chicken. Yeah. But you know, that kind of any superficial level of describing what the food is, she didn't because she was aware of the layering. That made a big difference and yes, it changed my life. Then comes the first restaurant. It's been basically that restaurant, though they've had different locations, so they're back on Kingley Street now, yes, yeah. which is where the restaurant was. And I think the second life-changing thing was when Netflix's chef ta Chef's Table, which every chef in the world tried their best to get onto, decided that of all the chefs in England, all the Gordon Ramsay's, Heston Blumenthal's, all the sort of three Michelin star chefs, they didn't want any of them. They wanted Aspa Khan. And Aspa had not approached them. Aspa didn't even think she was going to be part of it. But they came to the restaurant, they loved her, they loved her story, and they put her in. That's roughly correct? Yes, yes, that's absolutely correct. And the thing is, initially, I, I did have Netflix, but I had no time. I, had, I was cooking. I'd never seen a single episode of Chef's Table. So when they told me, I had no idea really what I was supposed to do. And I didn't still see it. And that's probably why my episode is so different. Yeah. Also, I was not scripted. I was not scripted at all. From the beginning to the end, I told my story. I told them that please let me tell my story. Also, let me show my team. And their first reaction was not a single chef who yeah. they had featured before showed their team. And I said, I stand on the shoulders of giants. How can I not show them? And they let me do it. And I said, I want to go and I to my parents' house. They said, this throws the budget out of everything. Let's go. Literally in five days, we were illegal in my parents' home, in my father's bar, you know, walking around the fortress and the house. And they understood. I was trying to tell a story from a very different rhythm. And they were great. They were willing to take me. And Netflix sanctioned extra money, and we were in India. And that won awards, that episode. Yes, yes, it did. And it's I one of their most unusual and most appreciated episodes. Yes, I believe. I mean, obviously not in, it's not out in public. But the second most watched Chef's Table episode after the first one in Massimo. This yeah. is the second most watched episode. I came in Series 6. It says something not just, not about my episode. But it talks, it's really about, you can be brave. You can speak in a different accent. You can tell a different story. You will be accepted. If you are scared to be a storyteller, please stop that because my success or whatever you call it is an example that you can be brave, you can tell stories, you can be so deeply confident. I still wear a shalwar kameez every day to work. I don't have to dress like another person because I am so comfortable in my skin in my brown skin, in my accented voice, in my Muslim name. I am so proud of all of this that everything else doesn't matter. Well, there are successful people in the UK of what they call Asian origin, or what we would call Indian Pakistani origin, but nearly every one of them to try and make it has tried to be as British as possible. If you saw Rishi Sunak on television and you turned down the darkness control so you couldn't see the picture and you just heard him. There is nothing in his voice that suggests that he is not British. And that has been pretty much the key to making it in Britain. And I think it's to Britain's credit that a little like America became a melting pot. Britain has allowed so many people from all over the world to come and do things and rise to the top. The thing about Aspa is that though she says things about issues affecting Brits, racism, the position of British women, the position of Indian women in Britain, all of that, she's also very proudly Indian. If you've seen the average chef's table episode, it's the chef in the kitchen, it's the chef serving dishes, it's the chef with two pigs who he says he's raised and he loves when you know he's actually going to kill them after the show. It's the chef in the farm. 
Aspas was different. She went back to India. She showed us her roots. She showed us her story. And she showed us where her food came from. So to be able to be proudly Indian and yet have such an important part in British life at the same time is a very difficult feat, isn't it? Yes, it is difficult. It is difficult and I tell people I meet everywhere that I'm from the East and I'm from the West. You know, you can hear that in my accent. But I also feel that I, I can be both. I can be everything. Because for me, I belong to the Vatan, which for me is the Vatan of women, of Shakti of women. We are the country that worship the goddess, but not the woman in the house. The female in the house, the daughter, suddenly becomes all about Izzat and honor. That you will celebrate the birth of a boy, but not of a girl. And I, my homeland is the homeland of the disconnected, the abandoned, the uncelebrated. And that's where I come from. I'm rooted there in that space where women have not found glory. They have not found equality. Their, their personal space is not guaranteed. Women who work in kitchens in England are physically assaulted. And I can tell you this as a lawyer. If you touched that person outside that kitchen, you'd be in bloody jail. But for somehow, chefs are being allowed to physically and sexually harass women. And there's a lot of racism in kitchens. And no one is afraid of the law because somehow he's that god in the kitchen. And no owner will actually sack the head chef, but they will sack the black kitchen porter who is complaining or the woman is complaining. And yeah. that's the power balance. And that's why I speak up. We first went to Asma's restaurant before her Netflix episode had come out, where it had been shot. And we didn't think she was going to be there because she was supposed to be in Berlin or somewhere where they were showing the episode at a festival. And we knew her, though not as a chef, and didn't know her that way. We hadn't seen her for years. And the first thing my wife said when she walked into that restaurant is, I love it. So I said, I haven't eaten the food. You haven't done anything. That day, the lift wasn't working. So we climbed two floors to get there. And she said, no, I love it because it has fem female energy. It symbolizes feminine energy. And later we went into the kitchen and it was an all-woman kitchen. So was that deliberate from the beginning, that feminine energy? It wasn't. I, I can always lie and say that this was a f great feminist plot. It wasn't. The thing is, which we you would have to accept, yeah. all male chefs that are prominent in the East or the West, their CV looks identical. They went to the same culinary school, they yeah. trained in Oberoi's and Taj. They make the same kali dal, they make the same butter chicken, and the training, they learnt in a stainless steel empire, they learnt how to cook batch cooking, mass cooking. I couldn't work with any of them because I, for me it is food that is cooked by andas, by estimate, for my eyes and my hands. We cook with a rhythm, we cook as a collective. No one is allowed to be this person who is this turbulent artist, the Van Gogh. They're not painting this masterpiece, but every chef will think that's what they are. They'll think they're Van Gogh. I cannot tolerate this kind of nonsense. So I was not going to hire the men, really because I would freak out. I needed people to keep the ego out, to bring the love into the kitchen, not to be about me, me, I, I. To be, I'm not saying that all these male chefs are. My God, it's come across as that. No, I'm not saying it. Okay. You are saying it, so that's why it's come <laughs> across as that. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, but the point is that this whole idea that you are this great human being and everybody is worshipping at your, at your doorstep because you are this incredible person. This doesn't work. Anyone who works in the kitchen will know from the kitchen porter to the person who is doing the basic cutting of onions, which is the worst job, you are working with a team. The team can make and break you. A restaurant has to close if the kitchen porter in England, mostly it is a black man, hasn't come to work. You cannot wash the plates. You cannot open. But you can manage if the head chef doesn't come. The power actually doesn't belong where it says, where everyone thinks it is. It is not with the chef. Half the time the chef is not there. They are all over the place. They have eight restaurants in their name. How it can, if it is in your name, you should be there. You should be cooking, you should be serving. And yes, I do travel, but not that often. And when I go back, I am in my restaurant. Because 
for me, this is my izzat. It's what happens in my restaurant. But when chefs are seeing it as a financial thing, that's where they I couldn't work with them because I think we would just end up fighting a lot. That you would anyway, no? Yeah. <laughs> yes. People say to me, oh, Rasmada, you've known her for a long time. She's been a journalist. She's a qualified lawyer. She's now a great chef. Which one is the real Asma? And I say all of them and none of them because for Asma, these are just things she does. And I asked her about this once and I said, do you want it said on your gravestone? Here lies Asma Khan, one of the greatest chefs there was. And she said, no, I wanted to say, here lies Asma Khan who tried to make a difference. That's true. No? Yes, yes. I want... This is the legacy I leave and not just that, you know, I, I mentioned this with Seema that, you know, I... Uh, I struggled to raise money and I knew that I want to be that person that I didn't have in my life. I couldn't name anyone. So when the bank was refusing to give me money, saying, oh, this is a hobby, Mrs. Khan, how nice. I, at least now, any woman in her 40s, that's when I started, for 45, can come in and say, but there was Darjeeling Express. Even when I'm dead, and I hope I will be buried back in this country, in my, when I am dust, Still, I will live. I will live in the fact that someone can say my name, the name of my restaurant, these women who work together. We will live forever in this space of Indian food. And this, I mean, not just the generic Indian food, but all of us come from different regionals. But we are leaving a legacy. That is going to be our greatest achievement. Not being on chef's table, not anything else I do, not the money, not the cookbooks. These are all very nice and very important too. But our greatest legacy will be when I'm gone. I describe this as I am sowing a harvest. I will never reap. I will never see those young women who will come in and build empires, build restaurants, become famous, become powerful. But I, I am sowing the seeds. I know that. And I hope that long after me, there will be a brown skinned women coming in and kicking ass and showing the world that this is the country with the greatest cuisine and the most powerful people making this food are women. I, I know Seema touched on this in her session. In fact, she touched on all the things that I should have asked, would have asked you. But why is it? that when all of us say our mothers make the best food in India, even in India, so few women enter the kitchen. It's bias. The international kitchen. It's, it's bias. It's prejudice. Because somehow we think this whole thing, you know, about it being not elevated, not sophisticated. That's not professional. First of all, because it's free. That's the thing. You yeah. know, if, if, or every, if every meal at home came with a bill, we'd all suddenly appreciate it a lot. <laughs> because pyaar se, you know, apne dil se, everybody is feeding you, so you think there's no value in it. I'll eat on the note table. Se. That, this, is a, this is our culture. Yeah. Our culture is dismissive of women who cook. And this is so deeply ingrained in every part of this country that we, it's a kind of impossible situation to change. So you can't go into every house and say, apni maa ko thank you bolo, apni maa se poocho, what is her dream? Maybe she wants to sell her curry or she wants to sell the dokta that she's making professionally. Ko puchta nahi because they think, iski to kaam hai only to cook for us. She doesn't have any other role in life. And the fact that it is uncomplaining, it is open hearted. Who has ever left their mother or grandmother's house empty, without food? Not just are you fed, you are left with given boxes of food to take away that your driver is fed. This is, our culture is so wonderful. Instead, we are celebrating and trying to copy Bahar ke people. All our food is being made into fusion confusion by tweaking this and tweaking that and making, you know, samosa full of chocolate. I'm sure it's very difficult. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I... We forget you said that. Without, without, without reference to anyone. <laughs> this is, I'm not this referring to... A anyone. hypothetical example. Yeah, yeah. It's a hypothetical. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. That's the journalist who knows <laughs> at what point it was like. Yeah, it's just a hypothetical question. Yeah. These are all great things, but the whole point is that let's talk about the guy who makes a samosa, a shingara in Calcutta on the street. This is their USP. People will wait for cauliflower to come in winter to have the full copy shingara. So this is the thing that, you know, let's talk about that as well. 
And I also talk about the bloody chocolate samosa. But we need to be able to celebrate the uncelebrated. We need to have inner confidence that it doesn't take away from your achievement if you lift and praise others. I never see chefs praising other, not ordinary home cooks. I have to say ordinary because for them, this is yeah. dismissed. I think I've crossed that line of being a chef, a restauranter, and home cook. But there are very few like this. Okay. If you talk to Indians about food, food for us is about happiness, it's about joy. You said about how we are fed. And it's not really a science because it's an art. It's andaz. It's hard to measure. It's looking at it by the eye, deciding when something is ready. When this is our own food culture, why is it that on social media and on television and in restaurants, we've sort of abandoned it and instead you have these high pressure so-called cooking competitions or you have celebrity chefs giving you exact recipes about dishes that you and I will never make at home which they think are so wonderful they'll talk about themselves as though they're big deals etc why have we gone away from the simple joy of food why do we have all this pressure and all this punsiness now in India so much bakwas on television you see you know I mean, I'm, oh my God, I almost named the show. The Bold River. You mentioned it the last part. No, 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 no. That was too late, yeah. No, no, no. Are you happy? She said Master Chef Australia the last part. The Bold River. Okay, this is... I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But this whole thing that, you know, you're making all these tweaky, tweaky food and all Indians are thinking, wow, this is very elevated. It is all rubbish. The whole point is, flavor is linked to patience. Where you take time over the food and you cook with patience and love, there is something else that is fun. And this kind of pressured environment where people are doing outrageous things on television, trying to make it fun, like it's a sports, you know. This is Olympics, you know, we are going to beat each other to death over who is going to make this complicated dish in 25 minutes. And we are all watching people's cakes collapse and think, oh, yes, yeah. great. It is, we have also, we are responsible too. We have become warriors of this notanki. And that is what our food has been reduced to. And if you want to watch Notanki, problem is you will also get Notanki with food. Yeah. That is served to you. You can't just watch it on television, you will get food. And I often cannot understand this obsession, especially in, in England, you see this in a lot of the West, of tapa style Indian food. We are so insecure, we want to use food of another culture and copy it. Are my grandmother shaking in her grave. Because where is the roti and where is the chawal? You are feeding them once within one inch of food in a fancy plate and saying this is tapa style. Kaun khata hai yaar? Who, who eats without roti? Who eats without rice? But that in restaurants, they are making like this small plates. Bhaar mein jai yaar? This is small plates is not something that will fill your stomach. Shouldn't have said bhaar mein jai. No, no, it's a good thing. But they are trying to carb free Indian food which is... <laughs> well, no, sorry. You know, I, I saw this thing, there was this, I have to tell you, I saw this model, her both Khubsurati, she said she eats one tablespoon of rice a whole day. Are you just, I eat one tablespoon every three minutes to see a chawal paka ki day. What is this, yeah? Up to one tablespoon rice whole day. Achha, she looks very pretty. I'd rather look like this than at least know that my khaapi ke zindagi ho. So why have we lost the joy of food, the love of food? I mean, or you go to the, many of these so-called great Indian restaurants and the chef will come out sweating and shake hands and all that. And you, I always say to myself, you're probably technically a very good chef, but where's the happiness? Where's the joy in your food? It's gone. And the thing is that, you know, use your money to go and find those places where there is love, where there's respect and where there's honor in the food thing. Problem is that you know, we are also driven by all the hype and we go to these places that are soulless. And we can't see behind the kitchen walls. And I often ask, and I've had this big run-in with Michelin in England, asking them, can you release the figures of all your Michelin stars? What is the ethnic mix? What is the gender mix? Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We can't be so personal. You can give them a bloody star, but you don't want to know what is happening behind the kitchen because you are basically endorsing them. By giving them a star, you are saying, this is excellent food, please go in this direction. The tire company is telling you, make that trip, go and eat that food. But then, 
you don't want to know what's happening behind the walls. So everybody suddenly becomes all very kind of, you know, oh no, no, we don't want to step in their personal area. Unless someone goes in there and kicks their door down and actually sees what is happening behind the kitchen, we will continue to have this whole epidemic of violence and bullying in kitchens that women are at the lower rung. You do not become powerful. You can, and if you complain, you will get absolutely at the fringe. You will may not get another job. This is why it took Hollywood so long for the Me Too movement. Yeah. We are so far away from that happening with us that there are people who talk about rooms where a lot of things happen which are completely criminal. They're happening there. People whisper about them. No one will have the courage to take on these chefs. And I'm not going to name them here because this will be in big trouble. But you know these chefs exist. And they are thriving. In India? I, it, I'm not going to say. It's their personal footage. <laughs> but in India, what are you talking about? I'm not going to say. That's <laughs> okay. Go on, go on. No, no. Hey, I am. Okay. This is the thing I tell us. Chabi there, but say, what's it? What's it? Usually it works. No, usually it works. I saw him interviewing somebody where usko rulaya, usko actually rulaya. Kaha ya? Aye. Ab mein ne, ab mein bolu na. Ha, he made a chef cry. To ye mat karo mujhse. Yeah. Or wo bhi mere parents ke saamne. I am not getting into you, Chabi, but you made someone cry, and I know this. All right. Okay. I think we should throw this open. I'm sure lots of people have questions for as far there should be somebody with a microphone who will come up to you. So the way to do it is put your hand up. I'll recognize you. At that stage, you get up, you say who you are, and then ask your question. Yeah. You want to? Sorry. Okay. Take the questions from the men and the women. So they're easy enough to. Okay. Yeah. Over there, the person there. Hello. There's a person with a hand. Yeah, he's no, the, There's a person, the white shirt there with a the hand up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your anguish. Uh, and thank you for underscoring the fact that we don't have to go through it. You are like supposed to, to identify yourself at the okay, beginning. Okay, sorry. My name is Aditi. Okay. What else do I need to say? Ideally, whether you are a chef or whatever, but if no. not, if you just want me, Aditi, that's fine with me. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> love to eat food. I okay. love Indian food, of okay. course. So, uh, my question to you is, um, you said that we should be secure, we should be proud of ourselves and put ourselves out there. That's aspirational for a lot of us, men and women. So, how do you get there? I have gone through years of therapy to get there and still yet to get there. Really? So, okay. I think I... I think the big, there's a big role for us in how we are nurturing the next generation. Because for all of us, you know, who have been through this difficult time of being dismissed, being undermined, being, you know, gaslighted, you, I'm glad you're in therapy, there is this time you need to get help. You are already on the path of recovery when you accept the fact that you do need help. But I think that people who are powerful, who people see on social media, you have a duty of care. And I think that this is very important because instead of showing people, this is my holiday in Maldives or wherever you are, people need to talk about things that hurt. You know, everybody who's famous has not, is not hurt. It's not that they're not hurting, yeah. but they present themselves as so, you know, glistening. There's no issues. I think there's a time has come now for people to be honest. Okay. Good answer. Somebody else with a question? Cap was first. All right. Who? Oh. You, you can say which one it is. The, the guy with the cap. He put his hand up first. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking your time and coming from London. Uh, we really appreciate it, ma'am. My name is Vishwa Pratap Singh. I'm from Chandigarh. I am an advocate. So my question is, that when you started your career as a young intern from in Sunday Magazine, early 90s, under Mr. Veer Sangvi, so how was the experience, you know, uh, in the later in your life there when you became a chef? So how was the journalistic experience, you know, molded you to become the person you are? And is there any chance that uh, you come back to journalism in India because journalism of your vintage and Mr. Sangvi's vintage are slowly fading away from the scene. She, she's a lot younger than me, huh, before you talk about vintage. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Sangvi was one of the youngest editors in India after Indira yeah, Gandhi, so yeah, but he started very early. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a really good question. I think that uh, it, I, what has made me is not London. It's not studying law and my PhD and all my kind of honorary doctors, doctorships in Oxford University. It was Calcutta. It was Calcutta of our area, where we were treated as equal, where you, you know, I, 
I mean, I walked in without an English degree. I had done history. He gave me a job because I told him I really want to work. And the first thing is that what is your family going to think about? Say, I really might have to support my mother. He was kind. He understood. I am from a conservative Muslim family. He knew I was from a Nawab family. But he asked the kind questions and gave me a chance. Ye nahi hota hai. People don't open the doors. Everybody is worried that ye kaise lagega. There's so much of backbiting and networking that happens nowadays. It's very hard. And I, I think that my entire life, I learned to speak and I learned to write from Sunday, but also being in Calcutta, being in Lamartnia, being in Loretto College, all of that taught me that you are free. You are free to speak. Nobody will crush your dreams. This is a very important and this doesn't happen anymore. And about coming back to journalism, I am writing. I write quite a lot. I've written cookbooks, which are more like stories. But my, I also write poetry. One day, inshallah, I will publish it. And you're doing a TV show, which is journalism. Yes, I am doing a TV show right now with Raghav, who, Raghav Khanna, who made Raja Rasoi. These are really narratives and conversations with people where we're talking about food and the politics of food. And I have done no filming since Chef's Table. I really wanted to come home. I wanted to t talk about the things that make us what we are. And I have had a chance to come in and work with someone, Raghav, who's not restricting me. I am free to speak about whatever I want and being able to talk to some really interesting guests. And I'm really looking forward to it because I think that we don't get the right stories from here. You have too many Goras coming here, you know, making films about India. Oh, how exotic it is, how colorful it is. Those two words, though, I feel like I would die. <laughs> because exotic and colorful, they're laden. They're laden words. Yeah. They're laden for me. And they're used repeatedly by white people who come here to describe us and our food. They are not that. They are much more than that. They are more complex. We have so much more than being exotic and colorful. Okay. The gentleman in the third row, who's had his hand up for a while. Welcome, madam and uh, Sangmi, sir. I am a dairy engineer, and uh, I really like, especially uh, Sangmi, sir's uh, column in print and various uh, social media. In that, really, I am amazed at his depth of the columns. And uh, very specifically, I want to, Madam, speak about, there is a lot of technological development in food science. I am a dairy engineer. I know what is the profound effect of, especially fermented foods, uh, like um, uh, this dahi uh, uh, and all those things so with probiotics. These are, there are, people are doing PhD in this technology. So you have not enlightened, you are not okay. given in throwback on this role of science in it's a good. It's a good question. This role of science takes many parts. There's the sort of Ferran Adria kind of thing. But there are also ways in which the kitchen has changed in the ways. So where do you stand on science and cooking? Well, I mean, the thing is that I, you know, I know that, you know, kimchi that everybody's talking about, the origins are Indian. Fermenting has always happened. We've always had preservations. You know, you preserve, when there is abundance, you preserve for winter. The West is only discovering this now. So the world of scientists are now discovering what we've always known. How we preserve our food. It's a hot country. How you save things so that there is food in winter months. That in summer you have things. So I think I do not have any issues with using science as far as it is to kind of help the gut health, to look after people, to make sure that people are not hungry. And I am also very, very committed to the idea that we need to stop growing so much wheat in this country. We need to go back to the ancient grains that require less water. So there is a lot to be talked about with science, but this is not the platform for it. But I understand you know, your point. It is a very important point that we do need to talk about how science and food work together. That's a good question. The gentleman in the first row. Yeah, with the jacket. And moreover, there will be... Yeah, yeah, but there is, you have your question, huh? No, thank you so much for the very enlightening conversation here and as my your earlier conversation in the day. Um, my name is Ravi. Uh, as a day job, I am a professor at a university, but I spend more time uh, cooking than teaching. Uh, so I've been following your, both of your works for several years or decades. Uh, <clears throat> my question is that I believe there's a huge dichotomy between what all of us, both of you and all uh, 
uh, people in the food business say that food should be cooked with love and not follow recipes uh, uh, to the T and uh, and andaza and hath hath and see uh, sight smell should guide your food rather than uh, a book telling you fry for three and a half minutes. But then there is a plethora of food books which say. Uh, 200 grams of this and one teaspoon of that and and five grams of this uh, and then fry the onions for three minutes uh, how um, every heat source is different how does a book is, is there uh, a, a, is there a question yeah, coming uh, coming to it uh, how do you uh, and that's leading to a lot of stress among young cooks who who, who follow all these recipes and then their food doesn't look like as the picture in the book or on YouTube. So how do you get people to build the confidence to cook or with andaza and with love and with sight good question. while there are uh, books and YouTube channels and Instagram reels telling you 500 grams of this? Okay. How, how do we... Okay. That's a good, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good question. So I, my, not that I'm trying to promote my book, but I wrote my book in two tracks. I told them what the smell would be, what the look is. When you hear the mustard seed pop, this is what you do, you know, and the, you know, when the onions are brown, you know, your hair should be smelling and your neighbor's flat as well. Then you know it is perfect. <laughs> so I did that, but I also gave the accurate um, measurements. The reason why you have to do this is people are cooking who have never eaten this food, yeah. who do not know what it looks like. So the problem is that actually both are right. Yeah. Both are right. They cannot work separately. You cannot have a recipe or any instructions which is intuitive because even I'll tell you one thing, onions in England are full of water yeah. and onions in this country are chota chotu all sukhawa. So the time they will take to fry is different. So you cannot just go by time. You have to go. But a well-written cookbook takes you to along both and it comes from the confidence that at some point you know what's okay. happening. I've got time for one question. The lady there who's had a hand up in the dark glasses. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Harshita. I'm a millet entrepreneur. And I have just launched my millet brand here at JLF. There's uh, a question in this or a commercial? Yes. No, no. Okay. There's a question All right. All coming. Right. So I actually wanted to know there's a big uh, hoopla created around millets. Uh, there's an international year of millets. Uh, celebrated and what is your take on it? Is it going to stay or? Uh, okay. Minutes here to stay, gimmick or what? Uh, I mean, I'm afraid because of the fact that it has become very political that it can be hmm. end up being a gimmick. But uh, I think that it's very important as I touched on this even before your question yeah. that we should also be growing our ancient grains which require less water, you know, and also can, you know, can withstand the heat. And this is very important. I hope it continues because the problem with when politicians get involved with food is always a downhill track. So I'm not taking any pot shots on any politician, but I really feel that yes. you need people. It is a grassroots movement that will change things. It can never be top from down. the top right. down. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all we have time for Thank the you. buzzing me of the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Aspatan.